All right, everyone, welcome to the Nordic Sound Channel. As always, I'm your host, Jameson Foster, and today we are humbled to have Benny Broughton with us of the, what I like to call the Broughton Dynasty. His brother, Chell, is also a musician who we're going to be having on soon. Um, and so, hello, Benny, how are you doing? Hey, I'm great. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, and your help. Oh, I'm doing fine too. It's uh, it's funny how Colorado weather works. Uh, when I interviewed Runehild uh, a week and a half ago, I was you know sweating to death, uh, and now it's 40 degrees outside, uh, 40 Fahrenheit. Uh, so I don't know what that is in Celsius, but it's cold. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either, but I know it's way less. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's how I'm doing. It, it's great to have you on. I've been looking forward to this all week. Uh, so how about for? since my audience is primarily American uh, music consumers or, or music hobbyists, um, a big part of my job is just introducing Nordic musicians to an American audience, because usually when Americans hear about, you know, the Nordic music scene, um, more than likely they're only going to know Varjuna, Heilung, and maybe they're going to know folk bands too, such as Vesen. I don't know if you're familiar with them, uh, but those are the big, uh, when you say Nordic music here, that's not death metal or something like that. Uh, and so I would love for you to just briefly introduce yourself, uh, what you do and why you're here. <laughs> yeah, uh, why I'm here is quite sim simple. I was watching the podcast you did with Runeild and we got in touch and then we agreed to do this. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, where should I start? Uh, how about you already um, introduced what my name? Yeah. So what? Uh, so where are you from? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm from. I guess you should call it kind of southeast Norway, quite okay. close to Oslo. But we grew up on a farm, so All I'm right, an cool. inland farm boy. Okay. <laughs> and now I'm living in in an area called uh, Telemark, which I absolutely love. I've been in love with with this uh, area for yeah most of my life, really. And a bit more than a year ago, I moved here. And this is fantastic. I usually say that if it wasn't for Telemark, Norway wouldn't have any folk music. <laughs> I was going to ask, do you do you uh, hear much fiddling? Like the hard on nah, fiddling? No, nah, you, you don't hear it much here, but uh, there there is a lot of the Norwegian folk music that has been, I guess you can say, conserved in these parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I can tell a little funny story because some, yeah, I believe, were Dutch, Dutch people, they were sent up here to map Norway in the, the uh, 17 something uh, and uh, when they came back uh, this uh, I guess you would call it county maybe or municipality mm -hmm. or something either one works uh, uh, this area they heard it was a lot of mountains and lakes here so how it ended up on on the map was uh, a circle of mountains with a, a water in the middle and it said don't go there <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how a lot of scandinavia was mapped in the early days it was just yeah, yeah. a picture of a mountain and maybe maybe some sort of troll and saying don't go here <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a lot of valleys and um, uh, it's a great place very powerful oh yeah so. i i was i was so because that was my first time in norway uh at for midgard's bloat this year uh i was supposed to go in 2020 but we all know how that story ends um, <laughs> and I was impressed at how, not impressed, I was actually surprised at how much Norway looks like the state Pennsylvania here in the States. I don't know if you've ever been to Pennsylvania, uh, but I grew up in Maryland, which is right on the border of Pennsylvania and right around Oslo. Um, you know, I was expecting the type of Norway you see like in the movies or the, or the, the books or National Geographic. And I was like, this is Pennsylvania with a beach, <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> which is yeah. awesome. It, it, it felt like Amish country here. Uh, it's a really great yeah. area. <laughs> oh. well, was that the? It was you that made this uh, video on the last day there, where you uh, compared it to Vermont. Yeah, so it's weird that the area you watched that. Oh, awesome! Thank you. I didn't yeah, know. That. Of course, <laughs> you out. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah. So the the area immediately outside of Oslo is like. Pennsylvania but then as soon as you get outside towards like uh, Horton or Buda it's way more like Vermont or New Hampshire it's just what was really cool to me about Norway was how quickly the scenery changes as you just go in any direction so you really never know what's around the corner 
That's very true, actually. Yeah, so I felt like I it felt like home in Buddha, especially with the with the water and everything. Because you're in Colorado, I don't really have much water. <laughs> nah, but wow, man, Colorado is great. Oh, I'm not complaining. Yesterday, the the storm clouds came over the mountains and it looked like a black metal cover. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah, oh, I'm not complaining about that. Only in co- only in colors. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, Benny, let's let's talk about uh, your your background as a musician. Um, so, today you primarily drum, or or what what do your what instruments do you primarily play nowadays? Uh, it's the drum and the voice mostly. Oh yeah, because I I'm gonna pick your brain about throat singing or whatever you call the type of singing that you do because you are very good at it. Uh, <laughs> but as, before we talk about that, um, what sort of music did you do growing up? If nowadays you do singing and drumming, what was it like when you were younger? Uh, for many years, I was playing, you know, hard rock, ba- uh, bass guitarist. Me too. You know, I, Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As we said, bass is the place, right? Bass is the place. I've, I've got it around here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got mine. Yeah, it's in the next room. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, no, I was uh, playing. I, I, I don't think I've ever played metal, but I okay. played hard rock and heavy rock. Mm-hmm. One band we had uh, many years ago, we called it Industrial Space Punk. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Oh, it was good. But we were we were a bit early, I think, because we used samples and stuff. And uh, this was in the early and mid-90s. So Ooh. I remember one, one time our singer met uh, the editor of a Norwegian metal fan scene on the tram stop late at night. And he got verbally, seriously abused because we were destroying metal. Oh no! Oh yeah, I had that feeling when you said samples. I was like, "Oh, this isn't going to end good." <laughs> I don't know, but I, I'm thinking if uh, we released uh, what was it, a seven inch and some tracks on compilations, and then we released the full album. And I think if the album had come a few years later, it would be easier for people. Several of the re- reviews said, "This is too much." <laughs> oh man! And look at you now, right? So what, uh, when you say hard rock, uh, what sort of bands? Uh, you mean names or uh, styles of music? I mean, uh, ba- you know. If you have any band names to give out, just an idea of, of what yeah. you were listening to, what you were playing. Nah, one of, or two of my, yeah, this that I was mentioning now was called Dunkelheit. I've heard means, of them. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's not to be confused with the, you know, this uh, record by this guy from Bergen. You okay, <laughs> the, the guy you're not supposed to mention. Oh right. Oh, you know what? I might be thinking of that album. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because if you Google it, he comes up. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. But, <laughs> we'll leave uh, we'll leave that a mystery for the listeners who get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but the band name it came from um, uh, a German version of the film Prince of Darkness because in German it's called Fürsten der Dunkelheit. Okay. So that's where the name come from. All right, came awesome. From. But it was uh, that, that was a funny band. The biggest lineup we had, I think we were two drummers and a percussionist, two bass players, three guitarists, a singer, and a couple of jugglers. Well, the jugglers just threw me off, I got to say. <laughs> That's like a whole orchestra you got there. Oh, yeah. But it was fun. It was people from, I don't know, have you heard of a Norwegian uh, band called Red Harvest? Vague? It, it's ringing a bell. Ah, they were awesome. They were okay really cool but it was uh it was started by some of those people and i was lucky enough to meet them and be able to join it was a whole lot of fun and then right. i played in a, a band called dr fong um where i played bass and did most of the singing uh, and then uh, the last rock band i played in was called speaker but it's not as in the, the thing that makes uh, sound in norwegian speaker is nail Okay, like a fingernail or a or like yeah, a nail? no, like a, you know, <laughs> a nail. Yeah, and you know, the, the name came because uh, the singer and the guitarist they were both heartbroken and uh, they were out drinking and they went up to a roof somewhere to do their thing and then one of them sat down on a nail and that's where the band name came from. <laughs> I was wondering if uh, I don't know if, if you know this, but one of the one of the biggest mysteries of Norse mythology is Nagelfar. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the boat made of nails. Uh, people still today yeah. are arguing whether that is fingernails or hammer nails. Neither one is pleasant, <laughs> but we, we like so, the idea of it just being fingernails, right? 
since, since you're Matthias' as assistant, uh, I guess I shouldn't say too much about that because you guys know it, but I've always thought of no, it please, as fiction. Please tell us, yeah. Yeah, everyone does because it's more interesting. It's more creepy. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but then you also have the aspect of what, what do you do with the remnants of your body? Yep. You know? <laughs> Quite often I put them in the fire just to be sure. <laughs> oh, I love that. See, that that's always something that I've wondered, like, because to me, if you if you take it as a story of the ship is made of finger of nail clippings, it feels like that would have the backwards effect of getting kids scared of clipping their nails. Uh, but I like the idea you have. If you throw it in the fire and burn them, that's a lesson to not leave them lying around. I like yep. that. Never thought of that before. I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so let's use let's use Nagelfar as a as a transition here. So you 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 grew up playing. You'll get your turn, buddy. I promise. Uh, you grew up playing hard rock on the electric bass. Yeah. Where does Folket Portofor Nordavinden and Viking music come from? Uh, that might be a really huge topic. But let's try to chisel at it because that's quite a jump. <laughs> yeah, but but, but uh, I forgot this. <laughs> I should say that also. I've been uh, I've been doing ambient soundscapes for. Ah, since well, I mean, early nineties. Since before it was cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, when uh, when uh, Gilbert was making the Neptune Towers records, or Fenris was making the Neptune Towers records, I was also working on it. You know. Oh so, yeah, awesome. Uh, not his records, but uh, the first. Uh, this project is called Origami Galactica. Okay. I mean, I will try to say it in American because uh, it's difficult for, for Americans. So then I guess it would be Origami Galactica or something like that. <laughs> uh, so, so you've worked with Gulva? No, no, no. But oh, okay. uh, at the same time as he was doing the Neptune Towers. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. You know, I was starting this. The, the first Origami Galactica record uh, was re recorded uh, during Christmas 94. Okay. So... Uh, but I, I've been touring internationally uh, with uh, that kind of stuff yeah, since 94, actually. Yeah, so, so you've been uh, at this for a bit. Yeah, yeah. But uh, b back then, you know, we all come from, I think I can say we all come from, because it includes Siel, my younger brother, and uh, Gustav, and all of us. We come from a school where you take what you have and you make the best of it. Because okay. none of us were able to, you know, buy the fancy equipment and all this stuff, you know. So uh, a guitarist didn't want his pedal, effect pedal, and he gave it to you, and you tried to, you know, make something out of it. But um, it was al always my dream to do acoustic ambient. Oh, that is so cool. Um, so a lot of this concept is going to be foreign to a lot of um, American listeners. So I would actually love you to tell, I, I would love it if you were to tell us more about the way that schools handle music growing up because i've always thought that was one of the coolest parts about norway was uh the i don't know what the word is for it but you guys have like those those music rooms that people can just like rent out um and like the communal instrument stuff i'd love to hear more about that yeah no i was uh when we grew up uh, the first band i played in uh the drummer He's a great guy. We're still uh, in touch on social media. I mean, not in touch, but we're social media friends. And yeah. he's a great guy. He wasn't the best drummer, but uh, <laughs> we were not the best musicians either. So, <laughs> but, but he he turned into more of a like a local politician guy doing stuff, you know, to make stuff happen for the youth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and there was this uh, in in Norway. You used to call him Rocke Verkstad, which means uh, rock workshop. Okay. Uh, which is basically a practice room. Mm -hmm. But there was one in uh, a small, uh, it's not a city, more like a village close to where we grew up and that, that was closed. So he was doing the blah, blah with the politicians and got all the equipment moved to, uh, to our little village. So uh, that's how it started. And, um, and that's where Shell started doing his first bands and stuff, you know, in that rehearsing space. Mm -hmm. uh, and it... Uh, I don't know if you even paid for it or if it was totally free. Some of them, I think you pay like a symbolic sum, you know, like mm -hmm. a $10 a month or something. And then you have your one or two days a week. So, uh, and there was a lot of that, uh, especially then uh, this was in the late uh, 80s and early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, 
and the 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 Labour Party in okay. uh, Norway was uh, working a lot to get that stuff happening, you know, to keep us off the street, basically. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but yeah. but for, for many of us, this this was great, you know. Mm -hmm. We had a place we could rehearse and we had a place to hang out and it made a like a brotherhood, sisterhood kind of thing with uh, all of us bands that was there, you know. And then we had the youth clubs that we were playing and uh, at this time we were, uh, uh, the man I was playing in, we were a little bit uh, older than, uh, than some of the other bands and we had more gigs than them and we mm -hmm. had our uh, picture in the newspapers and this, the local newspapers, you know, and the mm -hmm. posters hanging around. We were playing different youth clubs, not only in our village. So we were... Uh, I've got a couple of messages from from people that were playing with my younger brother at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, lately, actually, where where they were talking about uh, the inspiration that they had uh, from us, and Aww. it's important <laughs> to have these inspirations. You know, it's kind of strange for me to to see his comments and hear his comments and thinking, well, you're actually talking about me and my older brother and some other people. You know, it's a little <laughs> bit strange, <laughs> but it's also cool. You know. Is many years ago, and when people still remember it as a good thing in their uh, musical upbringing, I'm thinking, wow, that's great. Yeah, man, so, that's, the, uh, that's the effect music has on people. It's just the, the whole idea of having this space in your school that just has the instruments, and all you have to do is either walk in or sign your name for a, for a time slot, and you get to just play music on instruments you don't own. There's yeah. nothing, at least where I grew up, on, on the East Coast, there's nothing even comparable in the States to that. Um, all our music is, is once a week, we have to do singing <laughs> uh, and it's yeah. very half-assed. And then uh, and then in elementary school, you pick a band instrument, like a saxophone or a trumpet, um, and you do that once a week. And then that's really the extent of doing music in schools in America. You know, I got a lot of hangups with American schools, but I would have to say, even though I'm biased as a musician, that's my biggest hangup is how yeah. backburner music is. So I just want everyone listening to think of how different childhood would have been. If... But, 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 but it's very important to remember that this was not in school. Oh, I, mean, I thought it was a part of school. No, 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 no. no. The okay. music education we had in school was... Are we doing beeps on this, or can we say what no, we want? No, go for it. No, yeah, no filters. <laughs> the, the, the music in, in the school was, it sucked, man. Okay. You the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You had the recorder, you know, the flute. Oh, the thing really loved. Was, <laughs> now I, I, I absolutely love it, but we had those plastic ones that sounded horrible. And yeah, we did that too. And for each other, you know. It's not good. But That's, uh, that's that, interesting. That was, that was the music education in the school. It was one hour a week or something like that. <laughs> I remember when we started in the seventh grade, um, because back then it was, was uh, one to six was one part of the school, and then seven, eight, ninth grade was another part of school. But when we started in the seventh grade, we got a new music teacher. And the first thing she said was, the recorders, just forget them. I hate them. We're not going to use them. And everybody went, <laughs> oh, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> Victory. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but um, all, all this other stuff was like uh, to have us have something to do outside of school. Okay, gotcha. You were actually the first Norwegian musician I've talked to who who actually uh, has a more negative opinion of music in school. Um, so I'm going to pick your brain about that some other time because I really like that you're that you're sort of breaking rank there uh, with a different opinion. So we'll save that for later. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Your childhood is playing music in this in this space with your community, your brothers, your friends, uh, and you're also doing this ambient synth stuff. No, so, no, no, not oh, synth stuff. Oh, no, no. Okay. Not synth. I didn't have a keyboard, man. Oh, right. <laughs> Are you crazy? So, what sort of what sort of electronic stuff then? Uh, well, I was I've been touring with a four track tape recorder. Okay, you know, interesting. That's my main, main instrument. And then you have a delay pedal and uh, octave pedal and a micro tape player and, uh, you know, uh, one tour. I, I was touring the States 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I was using uh, mini disc players, you know, because <laughs> I didn't have a sampler. Uh, no, by then I also had a sampler, actually. 
but uh, to use the for the environmental recordings, mm -hmm. the field recordings, and this stuff, I had it on uh, on uh, mini discs because that was okay. at the time the most practical format. Um, and uh, but basically, it's always been, you know, whatever you have that can make it sound. You know, on the second Galactic album, uh, a great friend of mine, Monica. Uh, she's on the album and I asked her to come and because uh, she had a sampler, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, I borrowed from uh, one of the guys from Dunkelite. He had this, uh, I remember, a Vesta Fire delay pedal with two buttons on it. <laughs> so I borrowed this uh, and I was uh, playing micro tapes through that, making loops, recording it on cassette. And then Monica came with her sam sampler and the loops on the second uh, Galactic album, the first one, there ain't no loops, but on the second one, there is loops. And they are, uh, they're made like her, she was sampling from my cassettes with the micro tape through guitar pedal loops, you know. <laughs> so that, so this, this conversation is really showing like how ignorant I am of like electronic music. That's definitely a space I have to learn more about. Um, but then even when you when you say ambient stuff, it's very clear that I wasn't thinking far back enough. Like when you're talking about tapes and mini discs and stuff like that, that like to me, that's the sort of stuff I learned about in history, in music history class. Like that's how far back it is for me. So it's so cool to me that you actually had to go through all of that because, you know, we study people like Steve Reich uh, or, or other like classical, like uh uh, more modern composers and I remember all of my friends and I would be like they did all of that that sounds like so much work and here you were like yeah just did it because it was cool <laughs> yeah, but that, that was I mean we wanted to create mm -hmm. and we didn't have the money to buy the fancy equipment and we didn't know how to use it either by the way but uh, yeah <laughs> you know so we used what we had and what we could mm -hmm. and uh, that, that was the whole thing and I'm, I'm very very happy to come from that school mm -hmm. um, did you catch uh, Sisselbaum at the at the Midgash Blot? no unfortunately since I was doing the audio for for Matthias and Dan uh every day uh pretty much my whole afternoons I had to be in the museum uh so uh -huh. I, I unfortunately had to miss a lot of the midday bands uh, no, but uh, Thomas Sisselman is an old friend of mine, and okay. I remember he started because he he, he started uh, making music in the yeah, second half of the of the nineties, and he was uh, his roommate. He he had more money, so he mm -hmm. bought all the fancy equipment. You know all this uh, because back then the Roland started making all this uh, you know easy to use sampler stuff and whatever all this stuff is called. Uh, so his roommate bought all of that stuff, and Thomas he kind of attended our school, you know. Okay. <laughs> uh, what you have and make the most of it, and I mean, he's still making great music. Mm -hmm. His roommate back then, well, I I heard some years ago that he was still doing the you know the dance techno stuff, mm -hmm. but for me it was not to talk shit about him, to talk good about Thomas and. The, his stuff you know mm -hmm. it's much more interesting yeah and thomas is doing great you know mm -hmm. his concert at midgasblut this year was awesome i've heard great things i i keep uh, i'm slowly chipping away at all the bands that i missed uh and so i'm gonna i'm gonna check him out next uh i yeah he, uh, he's post he's posted his uh, concert on video on uh, social media so you can see it all right oh yeah i haven't seen it yet but i think it was filmed with several cameras and stuff so it should be quite good I oh think. cool so it's not like a bootleg <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Oh, he, he posted it himself. So. All right. Cool. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, where does the Viking stuff come in? Or I'd actually even want to pick your brain. People call it Viking music because we don't really have a better name for it. As someone who's sort of a veteran, uh, if I, if you will allow me to call you that, uh, yeah. what do you think about what it's called and all that? I know it sort of doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but we need something to call it, right? But none, none of us, I believe, I've never heard I not used the word Viking music. We've never used it. None of yeah. us. Uh, on the contrary, uh, if that is correct English, we've said exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. We've said many times in front of the audiences, we don't claim to play Viking music, but we don't use any materials that they didn't have access to. Right. You know. Yeah, that's, the con that's where the behind. confusion is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think this whole... You know, back when we started, the, the, this so-called genre, there was nothing. 
Right, you know, exactly. It, there was nothing like this. <laughs> and I'm thinking for me that the transition came uh, because we wanted, you know, I guess we wanted to do something which is real in a way, you know, which is true. You're not alone in thinking that. Uh, I hear that sentiment used by a lot of people who do the music that you do. Yeah. And um, I mean, uh, Shell and Gustav, they were earlier than me because they had this band called Evas. And I think they's, their first gig was New Year's Eve, 99 uh, till 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, I remember Shell talking to me about joining because uh, then they went to a Viking market and he told me about all these great people there. And I thought everybody I knew that was remotely interested in Viking and uh, runes and this kind of stuff was, uh, I mean, great people, but, um, you know, all occult interested people that were sitting in the bar looking depressed you know <laughs> they're great people but they were they, they were the guys sitting like this yeah. in the bar you know so I, thought, oh, I don't want to do that right and then uh, a couple of times i was uh, invited to jam with the uh, evas and and then i met these people and i thought wow this is great this mm -hmm. is something totally different you know uh, and uh, I, I really don't mean it as shit towards these people no no we got it we got it yeah we're all friends yeah, here yeah, <laughs> yeah but uh, uh i thought uh, first and then i met these people and i thought this is great and then uh, when uh, eva's kind of i don't know what you call it uh, yeah disappeared mm -hmm. and Shell wanted to start another band and um, th then i was ready and i was invited and uh, we started this uh, thing called squalder Oh, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of videos you might have seen mm -hmm. from Iceland and stuff. Oh, yeah, I love those. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good fun. We did that for, yeah, I think we did it from 2002 till maybe 11 or something, at least nine, maybe 11. Yeah, it was, uh, it, I just love the cinematography and like the video quality just put me right back to childhood. And I just like, he's like, that was the same time period that like all of, you know, your middle school educational videos were made. And so I was watching this, like, I feel like I'm watching the intro to a documentary I'd watch in middle school, but I mean that like a great way. Cause it like, it had that nostalgic thing for me. Um, so if it, if it was Shell and Gustav, cause I remember, I do know from them that they got started in the Viking markets and you uh, talked about that. Um, so you sort of joined it. How do I word this? So were you doing that sort of music before you joined up with them? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we, we gotcha, had, gotcha. We had, um, we called it Wurtebeck Space Band, mm -hmm. uh, which is a wordplay. And if you play it back to the origin, it means far out space band. Okay. And we were, we were everything from seven to 70 people, you know. Mm -hmm. The first the first gig we did, we improvised uh, space rock in A for two hours. Mm -hmm. I remember, I mean, we were fairly, <laughs> fairly broke at the time and I broke the E string on the bass pretty early in the set because I could not afford to buy good drinks, you know. So I remember going around to the people saying, hey, we need to play an A, I broke the E string. <laughs> <laughs> so we played space rock for two hours in A. Oh my but God, they also so had great. a lot of like uh, free for all, full moon, acoustic jams in uh, uh, several years we had in this uh, old uh, oil tank on an island outside of Oslo. You know, uh, the, um, there's a big concrete circle, I don't know how many meters high, and you climb through this hole where the oil cable or whatever you call okay. it was connected. You climb through there. And we had uh, that, we did the uh, couple of times in an old church ruin we did uh, an old water reservoir um, and all this stuff and it was free for all you know mm -hmm. and uh, of course uh, bring whatever you need and preferably something more you know some <laughs> extra in case somebody don't have any you know whatever it is and this was great fun yeah so, yeah uh, so when so when did you pick up the drum then ah that was this was we were drumming at this that stuff. was the same so it was just it happened while you were playing bass or like yeah, yeah, yeah. okay yeah. so you just yeah, slowly yeah. transitioned it, it, yeah okay awesome awesome but, so then uh, uh, for many years if you see pictures of scalded and folk and everything i'm using uh, one drum on mm -hmm. almost all the pictures and i love that drum but okay. i was uh, 
I, I was making noise with a band called Delusion. And okay. I was playing micro, micro tapes and stuff. And this was kind of a heavy dubbish, not very, but deep dubbish uh, music. Mm -hmm. Really nice bass lines and stuff on there. Yeah. But we were in the studio recording an album and the percussion guy, he wrote a lot of stuff. And in between the songs, we were having jams. Mm -hmm. And then I got to play this drum. And I, look, I looked at him and I said, hey, can, can, can we please go home together? And he said, yeah, yeah you can go with and then several years later, I met him on the street and I said, well, amen, I still have your drum. And he said, ah, you've had it for so long now. I guess we should consider it yours. And I'm like, you're kidding, man. <laughs> Me meeting that drum changed my life. That's beautiful. It's right next to me here, but it's in the bag. So, okay. <laughs> but, yeah, that's, uh, that's such a great the, story. The, the thing with this drum is it sounds awesome, but it's mm -hmm. difficult to record. Because most, most, uh, most of the tone is uh, around a hundred hertz. Oh yeah, that's rough. You know, yeah, that's <laughs> what you don't want in the speakers. Yeah. So when you play live, it sounds awesome. You know? Oh yeah. So uh, now I started uh, what I, the drums I used at Midgarsblut. Uh, I made them over the last couple of years. Basic, I made them. You for made the them. Album. Yeah, I, it's all the old drums that I took off the, you know, the cosmetics on and uh, I scraped the hides and, uh, you know, put them on. So I made them for the new album. That, so. That's incredible to me, like that you made your own instruments that you then record on, because it's actually funny. Only a couple of days ago, I, I sent a Chell a message asking where he gets his drums from. Uh, because, you know, when I'm shopping online, like there are no drum makers around me, um, which is surprising because this is like a hippie area. Uh, but, you know, when you shop for drums online, I don't know what I'm buying. I would rather not. And so I asked Chell and yeah, he said that he just has a collection. He made his frame drum. Uh, and to me, I don't know if it does for you, but that sort of makes it a lot more special. Yeah, yeah. You made the instruments. Yeah, yeah. I got the, um, that was the place we lived before moving here. Um, I called a friend of mine and her her father is uh, running a deer farm. Uh, I don't know what, the, is it doe deer? The bumby, you know, the one with the spots on. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a little one to be a fawn. Yeah, um, and I mean, a farm. Basically, it means that uh, they've uh, put fences around the big forest area and fields. So, I mean, they're mm -hmm. running free right. uh, in, in a big area. But then I called my friend and I said, hey, I need some hides and she spoke to her dad and he, he said yeah come so I went up there and there were six hides laying there for me because uh, it was slaughter time so I got them and the, and the only thing that was done basically was that the I guess the front legs were cut off and then they took it like you know mm -hmm. inverted it off I don't know how to say that in English Quartered it off or yeah 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 you, you cut off the legs on one side and then you grab it and boom, so I had to cut open the belly and do all the scraping and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned a lot from that. I'm much better at it now than I was. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, because like now you're saying that you, you not only made the drum, but you also are the one who gathered the materials to make the drum. I, I actually, I'm getting my, my hunter certification here in Colorado in just a couple of weeks because I want to do that same thing, you know, gathering the, the, the materials to actually make your own stuff that's I, i'm jealous as hell like that sounds like an awesome experience <laughs> yeah it is man oh but, yeah uh, yeah last year here uh, i got uh, from a farmer uh, we're living on a hill here and there there are six uh, living units on this hill mm -hmm. uh, and the, the farmer on the top i think is seventh or eighth generation on this hill okay so, um <laughs> And he came down here last year saying, ah, you guys eat meat? And I said, yeah, we do. I was vegetarian for more than 20 years, mm -hmm. but uh, now I'm eating meat again. And then he said, yeah, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I can give you some meat and you can do some work for me. And I said, yeah, well, what kind of meat? And then he was saying deer or sheep. And I was like, you kidding? <laughs> you want to give me deer? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm up for that, you know, but then, then I also get the hide. Yeah. And I have a lot of bones laying around here, the skulls and all this stuff, you know. <laughs> so uh, I've also made the, um, I can show you if you give me a yeah, second. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. I, 
I took it off the off the drum again because uh, I need to retighten it. But uh, <laughs> here it oh, is. Yeah. And this is shot like four kilometers further up the hill. Okay. Yeah. That's so like it's all connected, right? Like it's just yeah. that definitely makes it more special. Like especially looking back on the uh, the performance you guys did, like knowing that you made those drums. <laughs> the, the, the well, let's see. No, both both the drums I was using the hide. The animals were living uh, just outside of Hormestrum. Oh, yeah. So that, that's, I don't know, uh, how much is it? Uh, 25 minutes, uh, maybe, by car from uh, mm -hmm. the Midgardfoot Festival. You yeah, know? it's not far. <laughs> no. So uh, that's where the animals were living and grazing. Yeah. <laughs> God, that's so crazy. It, so I'm now realizing it, it's taken It's taken me... Uh, about a half an hour into this to actually mention the name of your band for the first time. So I'm still getting the hang of this, but so you guys are playing at the, for those of you who are listening to the Runa Hill uh, episode, uh, Benny is, uh, is it your band's primarily? Or is that, is that band your baby? Yeah. It's my okay, baby. So, so uh, Folket Portivor Nordewinden. And do I have the translation correct? That means the people from beyond the Northern wind. Yeah, I would say the, the people beyond the north winds or the, yeah, so yeah. All right, cool. So this band essentially played the whole two-hour opening ceremony, drumming nonstop, talk about uh, jamming an A for two hours. How about you just beat a drum for two hours, right? Um, yeah. And so you guys were sort of the first musical experience of the whole thing. Um, and so I was curious, how how long have you guys been doing the festival? Because that seems to be quite an honor to just get to do the opening ceremony we've done it since before the festival was actually whoa tell so, me more about that uh, uh the year before the first midgashbot festival there was something called i'd see okay i'm saying it very clearly now okay. in my dialect it's i'd see okay but i don't think you can do the l with the slap on it all right <laughs> i can practice i yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> But but anyways, um, Folke was playing there. It was uh, Gustav couldn't come then, so it was uh, I asked Chell to join us, and uh, for a two year period, this was in 14, 2014. So in I think it was 2013 and 14, uh, we had a um, uh, a lady called Ingri uh, singing with us. She's uh, have you heard of this song Liker, which is oh, Gustav yeah. and Maria and yep. Ingri. She was playing with Folke for two years. Okay, so it was cool. Ingrid Kjell and me. And then it was, uh, it was the first time uh, Hug Show was played live. Okay. Uh, with the uh, Dream and Enslaved. So Great, it was yeah, us yeah. playing. I think we played three times in the day at the festival. And then we did something in the lobby of the hotel later. Uh, and then it was uh, Enslaved, Vardruna, and uh, this uh, Skug Show. Uh, mm -hmm. And some Viking fighters from uh, Ravneklam outside of uh, Oslo, Jalarstadir. But um, I still remember it because our last show that day we were supposed to entertain in the lobby. Are you stressing with the time now? or No, not at all. No, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we were supposed to entertain the bands and business we were asked to do that. Okay. And, and we were there and you know I maybe you saw that at the festival you know i don't give in you know yeah, if i want to respond <laughs> you know if, if i spend half the gig you know demanding your response i'm, go I'm gonna keep going till you give it to me All right. <laughs> because that, that's when it starts to happen something you know it's not right. the, i mean of course it's cool for us but that's not what it's about mm -hmm. the exactly. healing in it is happening when you open up and you do what we ask you we don't do it for you to worship us. We do it for you to release you. At, all right. Awesome. I love that you said that because a big but, part... But, 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 oh, I, yeah. I want to finish that, please. Yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I did that. And I remember even Ingri was saying to me, hey, Benny, let him go. And I'm like, ah, am I supposed to give in? No way. No. <laughs> well, I managed to get that, you know. They were, mm -hmm. wow! Right. You know, <laughs> and then after we played, I turned around. And who was there behind me? That was Runa, you know, the oh. Midgash mama. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she, she just came there to to find something in her bag or something. And when I turned around after our set, it was just like three songs or something. Right. Uh, then, she, I mean, you could 
you could have put a bus in and out of her mouth and she wouldn't feel it. You know, <laughs> her jaw was scraping the floor mm -hmm. and she was looking at me and she was saying, what just happened? <laughs> so that's when that's when she, you know, really understood us. Because mm -hmm. I think the reason we were there was that she and Ingrid knew each other or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then uh, after, after this, uh, we started talking and she was talking about this ID she had for a festival, Midgarsblot. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, what Vikings could we get uh, involved in this and blah, 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 blah. So I, I, I am not saying this to make it sound like it's my festival because it's Runa's festival. You know, right. I'm just honored to be invited in to be a part of it. So I'm not trying to take anything away from her. It's her baby. Right. She grew up with Led Zeppelin and uh, those bands and North mythology. And she wanted to merge this, which is Midgarsblot. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not Led Zeppelin, but it's, you know, the contemporary rock music oh, yeah. and all the other stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I've been a part, part of it since then. And then uh, Folke also naturally, I remember saying to Gustav after that, I think this is this is a really cool thing to be a part of. Oh, know? yeah, absolutely. It's just absolutely, you know, the, my listeners or viewers have heard me go on for hours at this point as to just like how important or, or how special that whole event is for people. Uh, it definitely changes you in a way you can't, you really can't put it into words. <laughs> I'd say there, there ain't nothing like it. Nothing I like see, it. I see now around in Europe, I see, uh, you know, I, I see there are festivals in Germany that are opening with a ceremony, for example. Mm -hmm. And I know that some of the people doing this, I know that they have been to Midgarsblut. And I know that the ceremonies in Germany came after they went to Midgarsblut. You know, so it's also spreading. Mm -hmm. But before it there was nothing like it and i don't think that anything is like it what do you think has made it spread so fast because you know we me and me and Runehill talked about this like we didn't have this sort of music growing up especially not me because I, i'm 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 quite a bit younger than you two but like even me like when i was in middle school right like around around uh you know the the early 2000s and all that um there was nothing like this that you would listen to. And now all of a sudden music like this is headlining something called a heavy metal festival. And these festivals are popping up all over the place. And you watch a movie, you play a video game, anything, and you hear this music in it. So all of a sudden it went from being like this fringe Viking market thing to being a significant part of pop culture. What do you think, like, what do you think allowed that to happen? Or what do you think is, is the, the draw for so many people around the world? Um... I would like to bring it, a, I will get to that, yeah? Okay, yeah, yeah. Because as I said, when uh, when they started Evas and when, when Skaldir was started, and for many years, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was absolutely nothing. We've been verbally abused, physically attacked, and everything for bringing drums to Viking markets. And I mean, many people have liked us, but we, Gustav was physically attacked. I remember that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody came with a mag light and, you know, I remember we, we, we just stopped him. No! Mm -hmm. Because he wanted to, what do you call it, retaliate? Give it back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were like, no, it's not worth it. Super and as far as I remember, the same guy came the next day and asked us if any of us could introduce, I will not say what he was doing, but he was doing something at this market and he I'm pretty sure it was the same guy asking if we could introduce it. And what do you know? We all had a little bit of throat pain right then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what? You know? right. <laughs> right. But, but for me, going into this whole Viking scene, it was, I've never been that interested in Vikings. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it was being met on, on, on something that was very passionate for me. You know, this, right. I, I like to call it ur music but the english doesn't have a good word for ur oh right we don't because we even still use the german word when we use it we just say like a, an ur text or something like that yeah but ur the closest you get in english is ancient but when you say mm -hmm. ancient music people think about greece and that you know yep 
uh, which is not the same. Right. But, but what you guys are doing is helping primal. to spread that. Yeah. Yeah. Primal music, you know, yeah. something which is pure and raw and from the soul. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily very sophisticated all the time, you know? <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah, you're getting into this realm of like when you're getting into this space that everyone gets into when they're talking about this music is you start to run out of ways to describe it right like you're you're just like we all do you're sitting here listing off words like primal true uh earthen i've seen that word used a lot we're in this realm where like we don't we can't exactly place what it is about this music all we know is that it speaks to us in a much different way regardless of if it's associated with vikings or whatever the music itself just speaks to us in a way that we even or even more specifically you guys as the performers and the practitioners of this music even you struggle to sort of put it into words but but, but for us it doesn't matter you know we're yeah. just doing it i i, I don't care about the label you know <laughs> i i i don't like it when people call it norse mm -hmm. right <laughs> i don't think this, i don't think this is right nordic yeah ancient or uh, primal or whatever yeah but I think to for me this maybe I'm insulting you and Matthias no, and stuff now. No. But uh, because we agree with you. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm thinking when you call something Norse, you're kind of limiting it. You're putting it into a kind of a little box. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I don't think we fit into a box. Right, you don't at all. Um, especially like what you're talking about is something that's made me really happy about Midgard's bloat this year, is that I noticed that the music in general has sort of grown out of that box uh, if you think more particularly with nabala um like with them using the oh, right yeah right shell is of course you know nabala shell is with <laughs> play with them yeah yeah uh you know he's doing like that he even calls it an indo-nordic thing uh and using a lot of eastern uh inspirations but then you even have Highlung, where with their newest album uh First off, they just call themselves Amplified History. They don't even say that they're explicitly Nordic. But with their latest album, they it seems like they made a lot of effort to branch out and show how much either we have in common. I haven't talked to them more about it yet, so I sort of just have to go off of what their band camp says. Um, they, they're either bringing in outside inspiration to open up that box a little bit more, or at the very least, they're doing it just to show that it's not that different that uh, we all have some sort of shared base instinct i don't know <laughs> yeah but one thing people don't know is um have, you probably heard the song uris kahasu oh yeah the first record oh yeah, yeah. love it uh, when we made that one thank you when we made that one that was one of the few times that the big, big, we don't have a history of rehearsing you know okay we good hardly, we hardly ever do that i think in the 15 years of folk's existence we've had Five rehearsals maybe you know and not, <laughs> oh, with, a full man. Line, not, not with the full lineups you know yeah yeah but, uh, and, and Gustav and I because one of the reasons why when um, how, how much time do we have I'm good this? are okay? you if you're not worried about time I'm not worried about time man <laughs> okay <laughs> then I, can, then I can do it proper because okay. <laughs> this is squalder you know uh it kind of started fading away somehow. I was touring, that was the last time I was touring in Canada uh, in 2007. And then I was uh, trying to do the laptop uh, trick, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, oh man, that's just <laughs> boring to do as it is to watch, you know? Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, it sounded, sounded good, but it mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, it wasn't fun. Right. Uh, further, it wasn't that many shows. But I was playing in the prairies and uh, mm -hmm. and this and uh, no, it wasn't the last. Yeah, it was the last time I was in Canada. Uh, and then I, I I came home from that tour and I uh, spoke to Gustav and uh, another guy from um, Squalder, Jon Gunnar. Mm -hmm. He's okay. not uh, he's not done music for some years, but he's great. And I said, Hey guys, can you be my trio? You know, I I, I want to go acoustic. You know the, the yeah. other opposite you know um so um, in the beginning it was a little bit uh, vague the difference between for for and origami galactica trio <laughs> so 
there are videos of Origami Galactica Trio on uh, on YouTube where you can mm -hmm. see the three of us doing the hybrid, you know, electronics right. with the acoustics. Okay, uh, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I can, <laughs> that, uh, sound, that sounds <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, yeah, we did some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, but then uh, then it moved more and more into this, and uh, the reason why it ended up being the three of us in a way, I think, is that. Well, Gustav has to speak for himself, but I'm telling my experience, yeah? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Go for it. <laughs> we, we've always done it because we know it works. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always been about the spiritual side more than the music. You know, it's always been about healing more than music. You know, the music is the tool we use, but the work we do, it's about healing. You know, it's That's about... Beautiful. And and that's why it ended up for many years. It was basically him and me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and when we did this uh, Uri's Kahasu, we were uh, he, he came to where I was living at the time, and um, we were sitting out on the grass. It was a beautiful sunny day, and then we wanted to try this thing that he had experienced in India because he was quite a lot in India for some years. Mm -hmm. I've also been there uh, and had great experiences, but he was there a lot. And we wanted to try this mantra kind of thing that he had seen there, where they were singing every second word, you know, okay. back and forth. Mm -hmm. But ur is ka ha su, that's five, right? Oh, Which yeah. ev for every round, it's changing. So if it mm -hmm. starts with you, ur is ka ha su, ur is, it goes back and forth. Needless to say, we didn't manage. <laughs> but that's how the song came, you know. Yeah. So uh, I remember uh, when Gustav left, we had the drum beat and the Uri's Kahasu. He picked the runes, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I recorded the rest. And then Shell basically arranged that song, mm -hmm. you know. He, he mixed the whole first album. But this song, he did basically the arrangement on it. Right. Uh, I think he did a great job. Oh yeah, I mean, he's yeah, he's great. <laughs> he's great with the audio engineering stuff. You know? But that's how it started. And also on the new album, it's uh, three of the songs on the new album. It's a lot about India. Yeah. You know, I, I was sitting in one of these uh, what do you call them rickshaws. You know the mm -hmm. the bike cabs there. We were yeah, sitting yeah. there, and uh, there was this um, celebration coming where they have this uh, you know big uh, spikes through here with the uh, fruits and the. Uh, bills you mm -hmm. know money on them yeah yeah and it was this weird chaotic noisy music and then suddenly it came hey ah, i need to make a song in 13 right. and maybe one in 11 <laughs> so on the new album when you like mm -hmm. 13 Yandaha, 11 i noticed that i was like <laughs> but that's got to be weird for do, do you ever worry if if that's gonna like throw people off because usually listeners are used to like three four 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 six eight maybe if they're feeling spicy i don't know i i like i really love the way that you guys played with rhythm in the new in the new um album because it it, it seems to me and you can you can tell me either if i'm way off or to say more about it if i if i'm onto something it just seems like the way that you approach to writing music for this even from the lyrics is very cyclical like a lot yeah. of it is just going around and around uh, where i don't even notice that i just listened to a nine minute piece of music uh -huh. it was just it was just sound beautiful sound for an amount of time and i never once even thought of how much time has gone by this song's going on maybe it should end soon no it's just like like what you said, you're taking me along with you. It's <laughs> that's sort of exactly what happens uh, when I when I've been listening the last the last few weeks. Ah, perfect. That's great. <laughs> right, good. You're like mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah, um, but I've, I've, I've always loved the uh, Balkan music, for example. You know. Yep. And and there you have 38 uh, <laughs> whatever's you know. So for me. That is in the body. I remember some years ago we went to see um, Joran Bregovic and his wedding and funeral band. Okay. Playing at school. It's a great composer. And I'll uh, have to check him out. Yeah, yeah. He's he's made a lot of soundtracks and it's great. Okay, but, cool. Uh, he was playing with this wedding and funeral band. Mm -hmm. 
what a gig. But it was so, <laughs> it was so funny because the audience was, it seemed to be 50-50 Norwegian and Balkan okay. or, you know, Central European. Mm -hmm. uh, and the funny thing was, I mean, when you listen to that music, you're clapping offbeat, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing unka, 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 unka. Yep. Because then you're helping the music. But my experience, luckily, we were sitting in the Central European part of the audience where mm -hmm. the offbeat clapping was, because the Norwegians were clapping on the beat. I knew where this was going. <laughs> and when you listen to Balkan music, if you clap the flat one, you're killing it. Mm -hmm. You know, sorry about your ears with the clapping. No, but no, 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 that's, that's fine. Not, not loud. But I, like the same thing happens here in bluegrass festivals, right? So if you listen to bluegrass, the bass is going boom, 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 boom. And then the mandolin goes boom, ch boom, ch boom, ch boom. Yep. Ch and you are supposed to clap on the chick, right? Yeah. This is an American music being listened to by Americans. And even they're like, ha, 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 ha. And it's just, it doesn't work. It, it drives me no. crazy whenever I go to a bluegrass festival and people start clapping on the beat. I'm like, are you even listening? And then, and then yeah, I have to remind myself, I'm, a, I'm probably being a snob, right? <laughs> but it simply doesn't work. It doesn't work. I, that's what I say. Like, I don't care if I'm being a snob. It's not working. <laughs> but, but I'm thinking this... I don't know. Yeah, you can probably probably learn it, but I'm thinking it's also got to do with well, you you got it in the body or you don't. Right. Luckily mm -hmm. for me, not to brag or anything, but I have it in the body. For me, oh, these yeah. these rhythms. I mean, I'm not saying I can play all of them. Absolutely <laughs> not. Mm -hmm. But but I can feel them, and for me, they 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 feel natural. You know, they flow with the body. Right. So, but I cannot play them. I mean, hey. Yeah, because like that just that's just sort of how it works, you know, because as a as a music historian, it's just part of European history that rhythm was filtered out over time. Um, because just for, for a lot of reasons, I'll just I'll just like boil it down. Uh rhythm was just seen as like heathen, uh overly sexual uh for 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 music, right? And so just over time, uh the rhythmic aspect of music was filtered out as being unimportant. Or, or being too basic, right? And then the, the same thing sort of happens uh, in other places as well. And so what you guys are doing is you're sort of doing a lot of legwork, uh, no pun intended, of putting rhythm back into music. And it's my hope that like, at least what I witnessed at Midgard's Bloat, you know, over time, people got into the rhythms. I don't know if you ever got to go to one of the drum circles by the, by the camp, but there was a drum circle that happened every night and, you know, the first night, it was sort of funny. Like, no one really knew how to dance to it, but you could tell people wanted to. But by mm -hmm. the last night, people knew exactly what they were doing because they just yeah. stopped. Maybe they were too drunk, but, like, uh, which more power to them. But, like, they're not even thinking at that point. They're just moving to the rhythm. Um, yeah. And it's great what you guys are doing is you're sort of putting rhythm back into at least Scandinavian music. And, and I'm thinking, uh, didn't you mention something about this when you spoke to Runeil? Uh, about Einar's lecture or something uh, where he was talking oh, about yep. we are rhythmic beings. Yeah, humans are rhythmic. Yeah, he was like, you know, your heart yeah. beats, blood pumps, you wake, you sleep, but, you wake, you sleep, all that. But but ex existence is rhythmic, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. or cyclical. Was that the word you used? Cyclical. Yep. 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 You know, you have uh, spring, summer, autumn, winter, uh, rain, sun, you know, you have yeah. all uh, everything, you mm -hmm. know, absolutely moon, all of it. You know, <laughs> the twenty-six thousand year cycles uh, to do the whole round. Mm -hmm. Everything is rhythmical, you know. Right. So absolutely. We are also. We and just then, sort of forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, but it's also because people don't chop wood anymore, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's that's a good way to put it. <laughs> So, so was uh, it so with the new album was it so, like what else would you want to, i don't want to just boil the whole album down to cycles right so if if there was if it's cyclical right in the in the story in both the story that you told through the lyrics and in the music where um let's see i have to get the the names of the songs up because foreign language memorizing these songs but yeah so the whole for me the best part of the album i love the whole thing but from when you allow car othala ingvar all the way uh, into Dogod, I didn't no. even look at that as separate songs. They sort of just 
bled into each other and especially having Runehild on the album uh, singing high over your ch- over your chanting it just adds this whole extra layer it's almost like you guys are the ground and she's the sky and it sort of like makes this complete picture that was just incredible to me so how how else did you go into this album differently than your previous album uh, I'll be honest with you, yeah. Yeah, maybe please, one more jumbo for you and your listeners. I don't yeah. know, or watchers, or whatever we call it. But I feel I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And when you read the liner notes uh, on on the on the CD, mm-hmm. uh, it's also on. I don't know if the liner notes are on Bandcamp, but the lyrics you find them on Bandcamp in mm-hmm. four languages, which I'm right. proud of. Yep. Uh, please please be proud CD. of that. That's really great. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's important to get the message through. Mm-hmm. But what it says on the album is received and performed by. It doesn't say written and performed by. I love it. I, <laughs> I, you know, we we talked about this with, with Runehild. I, I seriously, I have this book somewhere around here, um, that was written by a uh, a Norwegian hardanger fiddler. Um, yeah. And she was pretty much interviewing her, uh, her teacher, her mentor, uh, who had taught her her whole life. And, you know, he's talking about a music tradition that is also folk music, right? Uh, I do consider what you guys do folk music, even though, you, as I talked about, you guys sort of, uh, you confuse them, right? But it's the same idea where this, this Hardanger Fiddler, the, the name of his book is To Be Nothing, right? And the whole idea is that when he plays music, he's nothing he's simply taking or he's simply allowing himself to be i don't know if there's a a better word for it but a conduit where the sound is there and he it just comes out of him it doesn't belong to him he's simply communicating it yeah he's the vessel he's not the vessel vessel yes thank you that was the word i was looking for (laughs) i I, one thing i've been thinking about a lot of times uh, prince you know, mm-hmm. Prince, yeah. yeah. He, he was talking about, he, he was saying uh, when he didn't want to release records, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, he said, I am music. If you want to experience the music, come to the show or something like that. But Absolutely. what stuck with me was the I am music. That is when I am, generally speaking, when I am the absolute happiest is when I am music. And you've seen us, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was the happiest I've been is when you were music. <laughs> I mean yeah, that, yeah. That, that, thank you. Yeah. But that's what it's about. And also the lyrics on this album. I mean, I, I wrote them down, yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, I remember when the first part of the, uh, the first lyrics that came for the album, because, okay, there's a couple of sentences on Ginungagap. Mm-hmm. But uh, now I'm talking lyrics, lyrics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first one that came uh, was Dagar. Okay. I was up at uh, Runahild's uh, with Gustav and her, and mm-hmm. we were starting the recording. We did the, a lot of the work on five tracks we did there. Ginungagap, Avenue uh, Karutala Ingvar, Dagar, Yamdaha. And uh, yeah, they, we recorded their vocals on Scheid Songir because mm-hmm. the rest of the song was already recorded, but we did those. And I was sitting there and then there was these lyrics coming. And after a while I was like, okay, okay, I'll go and write this. So I went outside our cabin and there's this big, uh, nice uh, stone slate, kind of a table or something mm-hmm. outside there. And I sat there and I was okay, bring it down. So I wrote down two verses and I went inside and uh, to Gustav and Runahild and I handed them the sheet of paper and I said, can we use this? And then I remember uh, Runahild, she was sitting there in the bed with a sheet of paper and she was reading it and she was closing her eyes and she was holding the paper, looking at it. And after a while she said, yes. And then she wrote the, the <laughs> third verse for it. Oh, that is so awesome. And, and I, I said yes many years ago, but I didn't know what I was saying yes to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I said yes. Beautiful. So, who am I to judge? You know, I've, I've already said yes. So, yeah. bring it on. Because <laughs> it's so, because 
one of the biggest struggles um, being a being a an ethnomusicologist today, which is you know we we're, we essentially do musical anthropology, is just because of the way that music is made and consumed and listened to nowadays um, entirely focuses on music like as a thing, right? It's the sound, right? But in reality, music is the activity and the sound is just a result of that activity. And yeah. so when, when you say things like it feels, when you say things like it feels primal, right? Which I like that word too. Is it is it because it you guys, when you're doing music, you're getting together and not to say that other genres don't do this, of course, but like when you guys get together and you're not worried about writing anything down, you're not really worried about recording at the moment, you're just making music together. Is that sort of what, what brings it all together for you guys? Because that's something I notice is very different uh, for you guys is it's much more of a get together with your friends and beat on the drums for a few hours and maybe something will happen. But if not, at least it was a really great few hours. Yeah. I think that's quite correct <laughs> all right cool <laughs> um the, the, the first record um talking about what you just said uh i, I was at a place in my life where uh, basically i was uh, i was trying to uh, to rise up from the ruins yeah right i was trying to build something with what at the time looked like a pile of rocks yeah okay yeah i i feel that <laughs> yeah and at, at that point and then Arve from grim frost got in touch with me and asked if mm -hmm. they could release an album and uh, there was already an album worth of songs mm -hmm. but for me at the time and that's why shell ended up doing it i asked him can you help me because otherwise i'm just going to break this thing off mm -hmm. You know, because at the time, first of all, I had more important things I felt to deal with in my life than producing a record. Mm -hmm. And I was happy with knowing that this stuff had come through me. You know, I had recorded it. It wasn't mixed and it didn't sound great necessarily, but it was there. And at the time I thought, well, I can be happy with this. You know, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, you know, it was very important for me to release records, but I've been on a whole lot of records, you know? Mm -hmm. I have this big wooden box here with tapes and CDs and vinyls yeah, and yeah. everything. It's not, it's not my main focus anymore, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I want the message out, yeah? You know? I, right. I, I want the tool to be available for people. Uh, not to sound pretentious, but... Uh, no, not at all, because what, what, you, what you show people is a different kind of music making where at least for my generation right because because i'm just going to venture a guess that i'm a little bit younger than you uh so for, for my, your dad, man. right yeah uh so <laughs> for for my generation right and i went through all of the practical music schools right like my undergrad i was playing this big dumb bass here with the like classically right don't call it dumb you did that when you spoke to the night less well the double bass I, is no i say that lovingly it's my yeah, big yeah. dumb base, okay. right? Because yeah, it has yeah. to take up, it sits, it's it's the size of a sofa, right? I, it, it's just my big dumb base. And I say that lovingly. Uh, yeah. She knows I love her. Um, yeah. That sounds abusive. Uh, let's just gloss over that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, oh man, where was I? Yeah, so I had to, so I got my undergrad degree doing classical music. And then I went to a conservatory for my master's degree, which is all classical music. And all along the way, I'm meeting classical musicians who started off not as classical musicians, where they were told, if you want to make music, get a degree, learn classical music so you can make a living doing it. And, you know, that I'm not even going to get into my hangups with how, with, you know, how that affects people, but you have a lot of people who then are led to believe that the only right way to do music is you practice, you get it perfect, you write it down so you can either record it or perform it in a way that people will pay money for. And if it's anything less than perfection, then people won't pay money for it. And if people don't pay money for it, then you're not making good music. That is the impression that it leaves on people my age and people who go through um, music school, essentially. But what you guys do is you show like that's not the only way to make music. And arguably that's not even the best way to make music because what really matters is that you are a vessel for music. Music is this beautiful thing. And 
majoring in it or or trying to be perfect at it sort of leads you to forget that you at least have the base talent of being able to make music. Not everyone does that. And that's a beautiful thing that sort of gets crushed out of you. Just the basic idea that you have this obligation or this compulsion in you to create music. And so this whole thing that you guys do where it's be a vessel, I feel like that's a way for young musicians such as myself, for us to sort of rehabilitate what music means to us because it's drilled into our heads that you sit down, you practice until you hate it, but at least you're perfect at it. I hate that. And I think that the way you guys make music, this is the probably a third time I'm going to say it, is the perfect way to rehabilitate the way that people look at music, at least in Europe and in, and in the United States, where it's this experience. It's not about the product. It's the experience of sitting down and either making music by yourself or making music with friends. Because I know a lot of people who loved music went through the system and now they don't touch the stuff because that love was crushed out of them. That love of just making music with people. Um, And so just, I just wanted to say that the way that you make music is really good for people. It's really inspirational um, to people who have felt that way. With, with a overhanging danger of insulting your uh, academic folk music friends. I do it all the time. So go for it. (laughs) But where is the folk in the academic it's not there. It's not, it's not in the, it's funny. That's the whole reason why uh, I'm an ethnomusicologist, which I think is the dumbest word in the world, because if you break it down, it means that I study people music. Yeah, but <laughs> That's what it means, right? I study people music. And then, it, but then musicology, the more general term, um, they study classical music. And yeah. so ethnomusicology has grown since the fifties into being a, a much bigger thing. But at the beginning, it was sort of like, the, oh, they just do folk music. They just do folk music. It's gotten better. Like uh, CU Boulder, the reason I'm here is because the the ethnomusicology program here is absolutely phenomenal. Ah, cool. Oh yeah. So don't don't you worry about that. We're working on it. <laughs> yep, but I'm thinking folk music. It's in mm-hmm. it's in the name even the it's terminology people, or yeah. whatever you call it. Folk music. <laughs> well, folk didn't go to academies there was no academies in most places at least right. not in northern europe mm-hmm. so folk music it's the music of the people exactly the people that, they didn't have the education but they gained the experience yes it's the experience that that is like super important that sort of gets filtered out of you uh, if, if you go through the ringer of music academia um so yeah that's just why for me the reason i like having musicians on this show is because this show started off as a classical music podcast this was a this was at first a project i did for a for a class i had um where i was just going through norwegian music history but over time you know i realized that there were a lot of people who really loved just being introduced to a new kind of music and now that i've got this listener base right uh, and hello everyone listening uh that it's used to this one way of making music but now I'm having musicians like you guys on, and I keep saying this phrase, you guys confuse the hell out of them, but I think it's a really good confusion. Um, it's something new in the way that just the basic way you approach music, this experience you're doing together with almost almost no consideration for, will I make money off of this? Am I good? It doesn't matter if you're good. It matters if you can just make music together and for a few hours just sort of forget about your problems. <laughs> I'm thinking, is it true? Is it true? Right. That, that's what matters. Is Does it speak to you? Yeah. And, and I'm thinking, well, to look at myself then, you know, I'm a quite steady drummer. I don't mm-hmm. consider myself a good drummer, but I'm fairly steady. Yeah, you and, are. <laughs> but, but as a singer, I don't consider myself a good singer. I'm trying my best every time. And I'm better than I was. And I'm happy with that. But I'm not considered myself a good singer uh, you know i'm giving my best every time i do it and sometimes it doesn't sometimes it doesn't sound good and that's what matters you know, sometimes it sounds good and i'm happy with that sometimes mm-hmm. it doesn't but it doesn't matter i'm giving right. it my best it's true to you and i'm there with you at the moment and i'm doing what i can you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm trying to give you the best that i i, I can do and I think it's great. I mean, I already told you, dude, your voice on that album, it's like thunder. 
it's it's so great i love it even when uh my wife was listening to it for the first time last night i had it on while we were while we were making dinner and she was just like this guy's voice is nasty but like in a really good way like that same way you say a <laughs> riff is nasty right so like yeah. the I don't know, man. It's just, but I think what you're saying there also sort of highlights what we're talking about. You're sitting here making wonderful, not to, not to flatter you too much, but you're sitting here making beautiful, wonderful music and you're good at it, but you're still sitting here. Like I'm not the best singer. That's sort of what we've been trained to do. We have to sort of almost justify, well, I'm not the best singer in the world, but this is what I can do to me. I'm like, yeah, it's hey, what you can do. It's beautiful. It's great. But, but, but imagine being me then. I'm standing there. Sometimes I'm on stage. On the one side, I have Gustav. On the other side, I have Runahild. And on the back, I have Espen. Oh, right. <laughs> and I have the microphone. <laughs> I mean, hey. All right. I get it. I get it in that context. When, yeah, <laughs> when you're surrounded, you're like, why do I have the microphone? <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's like that, you know. <laughs> oh, God, that's beautiful. But even if it's, even if they're better singers, like the music that you make, that's yours. And no one yeah. else can do it. Like, or at least it's what, it's what makes it special is because it comes from you. And that's always what I try to tell people. Um, you, you saw the, the videos I put up on social media of me playing the tall harp or something like that. I have so many people that are like, how do you do that? How do you just go outside and play music? Aren't you scared people are going to like judge you for it not sounding good? And I'm like, I like playing music outside. It's what I do. I, I sit at the base of the, the park that's here. Uh, it's the most popular park. I'll bring my toggle harpa there at the parking lot and play music just because I see people at the very least perk up a little bit when they hear it. But it's mostly for me because I prefer playing music in that setting than here in this stuffy apartment. Um, there, yeah. There's always going to be somebody saying this or that or this or that about it. And I mean, yeah, that's okay. It's Say you. what you want. Yeah. Say what you want. I'm not demanding that you like it. If you want, <laughs> great. If not, listen to something else then. Yeah, no. it's just the reason this is resonating with me so much uh, it, before we wrap up here is just um, my wife was a classical cellist growing up and her, she, uh, not not to make it a sob story, but like she had a, she had a really bad upbringing, like a really bad, uh, a, a bad family life, right? And she picked up the cello because she liked the cello, but over time it had to be this thing where you don't sound good enough. You don't sound good enough. You don't sound good enough. You'll never get into college, right? And now the cello sits in our closet. She doesn't touch it. And every time she does touch it, all of that stuff comes back about not being good enough. And I'm just trying to get her to play the, this drum back here with me. And even she's still like, oh, all I hear in my head is you're not good enough. Like that really leaves a mark on people. And again, fourth time, your music, I think, plays a key role in getting people over that. Because she she saw the videos of you guys playing. Um, she unfortunately couldn't go to Midgard's Blow. She couldn't get her passport ready in time. Um, but she's going next year. And when I was showing her the videos of you guys just drumming, people fully expressing themselves, not and with like almost no hint of self-consciousness, um, that was foreign to her. And it's foreign to a lot of people. Like the reason I said, oh man, when you said you don't practice, is I can imagine a lot of people here that you guys don't rehearse and they're like, how do you not practice? You won't know if it's good or not. Because it doesn't matter. What matters is that you, it's true, just like you said. And it's, it's, it's a way that you can express yourself that people can't take from you, no matter how hard they try. Uh, Runeil was touching this uh, subject the first time she was uh, playing with us. Yeah? Yeah. Me oh, right. <laughs> yeah. The lineup met 15 minutes before we went on stage. You know, I knew everybody. <laughs> Gustav knew everybody. But the whole lineup met like 15 minutes before we went on. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, the first time I saw Runahild, it was at uh, Gustav and I were playing at this, it was called Urkraft. It's like a shamanic festival kind okay. of that you see for some years. Mm -hmm. And we were booked there. The first evening it was, uh, I think maybe it was Birdi that you might have heard of. I'm sorry, repeat that one more time. Birdi. No, I've never heard of him. And they have uh, one or two albums out. They're right. quite good. You've given Birdi. me like you've given me so many new bands to listen to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but uh, I think it was them and Eli Vagar. You know the um, Runa Hild and uh, oh, Bjorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Bjorn is a great guy. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. that was the other half of Eli Vagar. He's a great guy. But I remember probably the first thing I said to Runeild, it was the next day. And we met uh, outside uh, around breakfast time. And uh, Gustav and I were there and she came. And I looked at her and I said, I would like to see you without that guy. Not anything bad about mm -hmm. Bjorn because he's great. But I wanted to see her, you know. And Absolutely. when I called her, when I called her and asked if she wanted to join us, what I said was literally, we've seen something in you that you haven't come out with yet, and that's what we want. Hell yeah! And that's what we got, you know? Because <laughs> she has like her voice; it grips you. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. When she starts singing on on like her guest parts on on these songs on the latest album. I can't stop listening. It's one of those, it's the type of thing where I can't turn it off, even if I have something to do. If someone calls, someone knocks at the door, I'm not turning that off right there. Like that's, because that's not, I don't want that interrupted. Uh, it just, yeah, it's absolutely crazy to me. And it was so funny, you know, people were listening to her and they were like, wait, so she said she was scared of making, because the part, and I'm going to pick her brain about this next time I have her on. She talked about how she was really scared of criticism. But then she moves on to being Runehild, where it's just this raw, nothing hiding you. It's just you. I want to know how she got there. And I have a feeling you have something to do with it. <laughs> yeah, you should ask her about that, not me. Oh, I right? will. I will, absolutely. Because, you know, what she, do what she does and what you do, with it, it's pretty special stuff and it's pretty unique. Uh, so that's why I'm really glad to have, have you guys on the show, because people need to hear about this type of music making. I, I, can I share something about this session that we did please, at her place? Yeah? Please, absolutely. First of all, for me, in, in my spiritual journey and musical journey, it was very important because, I mean, Gustav and now Runeild, they're I consider their, I mean, their brother and sister. Uh, they are two of my absolute favorite musicians in the whole world, and that includes everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, I look up to them, you know. I think they're much better singers than I am. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also very different, so there's no point comparing it, really. But, of course, inside myself, you know, I do this sometimes. Mm -hmm. But what I, what I realized when we were there in the studio, I thought, well, I've heard her, I've heard Gustav, I've heard them. And then I realized, but it's when I'm there, it sounds like Folke. You're that you're that ingredient. <laughs> that 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 is, you know, and not to make myself blah blah blah, but for me this on, on my personal journey, this was very important. Mm -hmm. Because then I then I realized, you know, I, and they they're not doing anything to make me feel like some kind of an underdog. Mm -hmm. But inside of myself, sometimes right. I do feel like that, you know. Oh, everyone, everyone feels that. Uh, yeah. You are talking to a lot of people right now that are absolutely hearing that and feeling it. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but it's the same for me, you know. Mm -hmm. And you, you've seen me on stage with Folke. I have that feeling, you know. No one but would I ever guess it. No one would ever guess that because you command that. Like you're up there and I'm like, okay, I'm listening to him. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. But but I, I'm thinking maybe, maybe that's why you're listening. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can. And sometimes it doesn't sound very well. Sometimes it sounds quite nice, you know. <laughs> and it's worth, it's worth, even if you're being hard on yourself, it's worth those few moments where you're doing something nice. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I love it. And and I, I think personally on the new album, I, I, I think, you know, I'm sing, singing better than I've ever done. It's great, yep. And that, that's the only thing I can compare with. There's no point me comparing myself to anybody else. I need to compare with myself. Mm -hmm. Am I better at what I'm doing than I was? And yes, I am. I'm happy with that, you know? Beautiful. And that's uh, sort of what it takes to do music, right? It's just you have to reach a point where you're at least happy with yourself or where at least you know that you're doing something that you need to do. And another thing I'm, I'm proud of, uh, it's like at Midgarsbot, we had three three gigs there, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the guild hall, we had a set list, okay? We were not completely agreeing on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, there was a set list, yeah? Yeah. Uh, 
the two other shows. We didn't even know what we should start with when we went up there. Beautiful. You know, <laughs> and I grabbed the microphone and started talking. I didn't know what was going to be the first song. Mm -hmm. You know, and to be able to pull up 45 minutes with, with a group of people and nothing is planned. Right. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. When I'm looking at Martin saying, Martin, would you like to do something? And Martin is like, okay. <laughs> you know, oh, that's it's great. You know. <laughs> that's a uh, man. That's just, again, I, the way that you were describing making music is probably giving a lot of people anxiety, <laughs> like not practicing, not agreeing on a set list, but I think it's good. I think it's good that you're, that you're showing that there's, there's not just one way of making music. And so before we wrap up, I just wanted to tell you, I want to tell you a quote. I've been, I've been racking my brain trying to remember who said it. It was either John Coltrane or Miles Davis um, when they were asked, you know, is jazz folk music? He said, either Miles or John Coltrane said, of course it's folk music. All music is folk music. I ain't never heard no horse play no saxophone. And it was just... You know, when you said that it's folk music, it's people music, I've been sitting here like, who said that line? It was, it was one of them. And I remember reading that in high school, being like, I like that a lot. I ain't never heard no horse play no saxophone, right? Like, <laughs> it's all folk music, right? It's very human. Uh, and that's what I think makes your, your music very special. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> it seems, somehow it seems to work. <laughs> And that's all you can ask for. So, yeah. Benny, it has been wonderful having you on the show. And it's been really wonderful getting to know you. Uh, it was, I was really, you know, I was really miffed that I, I didn't get to, to meet you at the festival. But, hey, at, at least you met here. It's been really yeah. great to talk to you. Where can people find you, Benny? Uh, well, I'm sitting now with my room here. <laughs> <laughs> on social media, where can people find you? No, we have, or your uh... music. Uh, the folk is on uh, all these, or uh, at least a whole lot of these digital things. It's on Spotify, mm -hmm. YouTube, Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if you really want to, I don't know, uh, understand what it's about or something. If you if yeah. you want to go into it, you know, buy the CD or go on Bandcamp where you can find the lyrics in uh, Norwegian as I sing them, and then uh, English, uh, German, and Spanish. Mm -hmm those songs that have the uh, have lyrics on them uh, i would appreciate that because i'll say that too you know buy the cds please buy cds guys i like <laughs> i've got i've got vinyls and cds everywhere over here because that's yeah. just like you know the money goes right to you guys especially on bandcamp fridays um when they the bandcamp doesn't take a cut but it's also just you know having that physical artifact in this in this day and age where we don't really own music anymore it's just we rent it from the streaming service you know i'm gonna i'm gonna join you benny to anyone listening please go out and buy the album if you're interested you won't be disappointed uh the, the newest album of course is at leva uten enda which means one life without end right yeah cool so i'll, I'll also put it in, in the in the show notes for people who who don't have the best aural norwegian so so absolutely go listen to the newest album and the last album as well benny anything Let, else you want to say before we go oh yeah i would like to go for another hour man oh but, it will come back again <laughs> but, but, uh, we've been talking about this uh, you know this genre if you can call it that that has oh yeah let's wrap up that conversation we sort of left it <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um uh, I, I I remember before I get to my point, if it's mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I please. remember because th this was back in the day of uh, MySpace. I don't know if you <laughs> oh, remember that. Yeah. That sends me back. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I I had the the Squalder MySpace page. Okay. I was doing it. I wasn't very good at it, but okay. uh, I had the password and that kind of stuff. And then uh, suddenly we got this friend request from uh, from a project. Uh, and, and I was listening to this project and I thought, wow, there's there's somebody else doing this kind of stuff as well. Not that it sounds the same, mm -hmm. but this was Vardruma. Okay. Know, when I came before the first album, so it must have been back in 2009 or something. Mm -hmm. And I remember my first reaction was, wow, there's somebody else doing this kind of stuff as well. Right. You know, because we had... Uh, 
when we started, the closest you could get to some kind of inspiration was the Tuvan and Mongolian guys, you know, like Hun Hur Tu and, uh, and this. Oh, yeah. And then you had the Harald Foss, for example. Uh, you, we, I have never heard guy. anyone else say his name. I, he was the first. I literally, okay, so when I was in high school, right, I was a huge dork. I got, I heard him on a Marth for the first time. Uh, video games I was playing just had Vikings in it. And so I was super into everything Viking. And that's how I got to where I am now, right? Um, I went into YouTube and literally Google and literally searched Viking music. And it was nothing but Harold Foss's stuff. And I haven't heard that name since I was showing pe my friends it in high school. And they were like, I don't know, man, this is a little weird. And I was like, weird, you're weird. Get out of here. So huh. you, you just sent me back saying his name. And I love that, that you mentioned him. The, the week before Midgars Blot, we were doing Tonsberg Viking Festival, yeah? Mm -hmm. With uh, yeah. Eric Espen, Martin and me. Okay. And uh, one of the gigs there was a uh, Harald Foss tribute. I did the... Oh. Uh, I did the Eirik Jarl, which mm -hmm. we've done quite a few times. That's my favorite one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How right. did I miss we're this? Oh, man. We've been doing that for years. Uh, maybe we'll do it for you next year. Then. Please but, do, uh, man. <laughs> but I was doing that, and then Martin was doing uh, Stanford Brua, the Stanford Bridge. Yep. So, uh, and we... We've done that many times over the years. You know, we get the audience to shout Harolfos, Harolfos, you know, <laughs> to get his name out there because he's not he's not bragging. You know, him and Mari, oh, yeah. his wife, they're wonderful people. Mm -hmm. And and in this kind of stuff, I mean, their first or his, I don't know if Mari was on that one. I don't know because I never had it. But their first uh, release, as far as I know, was a cassette mm -hmm. released in I don't know eighty nine or ninety or something. I got to know Harold. I went to, uh, it's called the Folk High School. Okay. Uh, where you go and you stay there for like 10 months or something. Mm -hmm. And I, I went there and Harold was a teacher. And then, this was from 1990 till 91. And he was talking about it back then that he was doing this kind of historical music, trying to keep it alive and uh, making the instruments himself and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then many years later, I met him again, you know, and I, I started hearing his stuff. And uh, it was back in the Squalder days. I recorded a demo uh, for uh, Mick Lagar, mm -hmm. uh, one of their fantastic songs. So I, I think we've done at least three or four of his songs with Folke. That is you know. so great. Yeah, you guys should definitely play more of them because it's great. Because even, do you know if, did he come up with the melody for Sigmund's Kvadet or was that already sort of a established folk song because i know enslaved even covered it and i was always wondering if enslaved was literally covering harold foss or if it was just a general folk song i cannot give you an answer to that but i would okay. not be surprised if i mean eva is in the in enslaved mm -hmm. i would not be surprised if i would be more surprised if he does not know harold than if he does i'm you gonna know, have I to talk to him about that then yeah <laughs> So, uh, I mean, uh, Einar, uh, I met at, uh, I believe I met him at the markets where uh, I met Harald and Mari also. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I don't know if they covered him. I, this I cannot say. Okay. But I know, and this has been, that's one of the reasons why I want to mention Harald mm -hmm. and Mari. Because I've also seen, uh, doesn't matter who it is, but quite well-known artists uh, posting on social media. Uh, where they do uh, songs from Harald and uh, the, the, the text says uh, this is an ancient Nordic song. One time I saw it and I wrote, well, actually it's not. It's written by Harald Foss. It was released on this record in 1995. You can order the record here. You know? <laughs> I remember well, one time I wrote that and it went three minutes and then there was a like from Einar on it, you know. <laughs> Yes, the ancients, 1995. <laughs> yeah, and I'm thinking, well, it's great, and I'm, I mean, I, I played the the demo I did for Mick Lagar. I played it for Harald and Mari, mm -hmm. and they were both laughing because it's quite different than theirs. But mm -hmm. I think they enjoyed it, mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that I, you know, it's with a jaws harp, it's with beats, it's with throat singing, the lyrics, everything, and they were especially Mari. She was just giggling when she heard, heard it, you know. But I, th I think they understand that it's also 
it's a way for me to say thank you, you know, thank you, really, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I want to get that out there. It's great that people are covering the songs, but then I think we should also remember to say who made them. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Because I know Enslaved was very, the reason I even, actually, you know what? That might have even been how I discovered Enslaved. I'm pretty sure that I was listening to Harold Foss's Sigmund's Quadet. Uh, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. Uh, but it's then. Okay, actually. Okay, cool. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, and I remember up on YouTube's recommended was Enslaved doing Sigmund's Quadet. And I was like, Enslaved? That doesn't seem like a folk band name. And I turned it on and it's not black metal. It's not heavy metal. It's actually just drums and throat singing and all of that. And I remember I then went to go look at their other music. I was like, whoa, that is not the same thing at all. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that's actually, I'm, that might be a funny story. Harold Foss got me into Enslaved. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he didn't see that coming. <laughs> no, not at all. Because you say he 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 probably was you know he was probably thinking that your version was you know very different. But I'm now sitting here wondering, did he ever hear Enslaved's version? Because that was you know electric guitar and all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, and he's a, they're both great people. Also, they're they are so lovely. Mm -hmm. They're really really nice people. All right, so, awesome. I, and I believe it. Their music their music is very you know the word you were using true. Absolutely. All right, I, Benny. To, to me, just before yep. we close this, yeah? Yeah, please. To me, he, in this whole kind of historical thing, mm -hmm. I believe he is my absolute favorite writer. You know, when it comes we to writing that. historical music, mm -hmm. because it's so, it's so down to earth it's not pretentious at all. He's writing not at all. great lyrics, uh, great melodies. He's made, if not all, most their instruments. I mean, uh, Marty's harp, he's made it, you know. Oh, he yeah. That harp, you know. That's so cool. Uh, yeah. So, so check and them out, people, if you're listening or watching this. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And the, it's funny. This is just how it's going to be. I have a feeling when we meet in person, we're going to talk for hours because now you say that. And it reminds me of, we were talking yesterday about major music, music, yeah, major, yeah, yeah. how it's not cool to do major uh, Viking, Viking music, right. With air quotes. Um, yeah. People just so we're on the same page, right? Like a lot, when we do find Viking age instruments, they're in major. <laughs> uh the the Jorvik panpipe that's do re mi fa sol yeah it's all major so uh that's another thing that i thought was really that i think is really unique about harold foss is songs like Irik jarl people are like that's not viking music it's happy mm. Ugh, it's not edgy enough <laughs> so anyway but yeah we definitely agree do, on do that do people really believe that the uh, colors were invented in the 60s when people started popping LSD? <laughs> oh, God, that's such a good way to put it. I love that. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll slowly sneak more and more major in there, right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A little bit at a time. It's like feeding a baby, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you listen to the new folk album, my girlfriend pointed this out, the title track. Yeah? Uh, oh, least, yeah. It, it's flamenco. Oh my God, it is. <laughs> That's incredible. I didn't, that, I didn't know that, but my girlfriend, she loves to dance. She's a good dancer. And she pointed out, hey, that's flamenco. And I'm like, wow, I uh, didn't see that. That just you got know. that stuck in my head all over again. I swear to God, I've had a uh, Ginunga Gap stuck in my head for like the last week straight. I will be walking around going, Ginunga Gap, Ginunga Gap, Ginunga Gap. It's just, and now it's back in there. So uh, it's going to be another week. <laughs> <laughs> I right, hope Benny. A painful air warm for you. Oh, it, no, it's great. I love it. Uh, so Benny, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your experience, your, your story with us. It's been really great talking to you and I cannot wait to talk to you again. And I especially can't wait to meet you in person next year uh, at Midgard's Bloat. All right. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, and as I always like to say, don't be a stranger. All right. Am I? No, not at all. <laughs> I feel, like, feel like I've known you for years. <laughs> yeah, likewise. All right, it's cool. A, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being interested. And oh, 
absolutely. I'm obsessed with this Nordic music scene to almost an unhealthy level. So you don't worry. I, I'm I'm going to be around for a bit. <laughs> but I'm I'm thinking the way you speak about it, it sounds to me, it sounds like it's in a very healthy way. All right, cool. Uh, that's the validation I needed for this addiction of mine. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Benny. You take care. Uh, I'll, I'll see you soon. All right. Yeah, yeah. Take care, man. Say hello to your wife and uh, the little oh, buddy. Yeah. Oh yeah, crickets right here. Yeah, you'll be able to meet. You'll be able to meet uh, Alyssa next year. All right. Yeah, yeah. Perfect, man. Take care. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. You too. See you later. Okay. See you.